thank you for coming along today. Um, this talk today is about is called Deploy to Android, but it's it's mainly about two um, two tools that you can use to get from Python to an Android device. Um, the first tool is called Kivi, and that's the thing that I'm going to be spending like 80% of this talk talking about. And the second thing is called the Pygame subset for Android. Um, this is just a short slide about me, which you don't actually need to look at all that deeply, other than to say that uh, Python is not my day job. It's not something that I do uh, all the time. It's something that I do from time to time when I have something, have a problem that I need to solve, I turn to Python. Uh, and why is that relevant? Well, it's relevant because um, despite me not having a deep knowledge of uh, how to do these things, I can still get my stuff going on Android. And if I can do it, uh, I think probably anybody can. Why? Why would you, why would you want to use um, this thing called uh, Kivi? Uh, and the, th the thing about Kivi is that uh, it solves um, a perennial problem with, with, with Python, in my view, which is that you've, once you've written your Python program, it's very difficult to get it out to people. Um, and so there are other solutions uh, where you can bundle up an exe and send it off to people. Um, Kivi sort of does that for Android, but not only does it do it for Android, it does it for um, iOS as well, although I'm not going to be talking about iOS uh, here. Um, the other thing that, um, that Kivi does, and so it, it, solves the, it solves the packaging and distribution problem by allowing you to develop on whatever, however you like, and then once you've finished developing on your PC or whatever, uh, it'll package up an APK for you and then you can just leverage off third-party app stores. You can put it up to Google Play, you can put it up to wherever you want that'll take an APK as long as you've got a developer account and can do what's necessary to um, get it up onto the, to take an, app, an APK and put it onto a, uh, an app store. Um, Kivi will get you to the APK and from there you can just leverage the power of these um, third-party app stores. And not only that, but it'll also allow you to use their uh, APIs. So you can use the Android APIs to do things like charging. If you want to do in-app billing, um, you can use Kivi to do that. I haven't, but I have read more stories of people who have um, been successful uh, in doing that. Um, so what is it? Well, it describes itself as an open source Python library for rapid development of applications. Uh, my experience is that it is primarily a uh, widget set plus um, some tools for event management. This is um, what a Kivi application looks like. This is my first, well, it's not my Kivi, it's what the widgets look like. Um, this is my first uh, application in Kivi, and it was originally written uh, in Tekinta for um, my old EPC701. The battery died one day and I discovered that I didn't have a portable device anymore or my portable device was an Android device. And so I needed to take that existing um, Tekinta code uh, and get it running on Android. Uh, and so that, that's what it, what it did. What this does is it allows me to review news articles and classify them. But what this slide shows is, um, you know, buttons, a drop down menu, some labels, a checkbox, um, an edit text area. So it's just a general sort of spread of the things which are, the widgets which are available um, through Kivi. Um, Kivi comes with a file dialog, so you can just, it can just, you can just ask it to do your file dialog for you and it'll um, put this up and allow you to choose things, you know, to select your file and it'll return the file name and path to you. Um, the, the main reason I'm putting up this slide is to show that um, Kivi allows you to do these things but it doesn't necessarily do all of the um, nice graphics for you. So down the bot bottom you can see a load and a cancel button and those buttons are extremely thin. It doesn't bother me because I've got a stylus and it's, this is just my own application. But you'd need to um, do the geometry of the, um, the device you're using in order to size the widgets properly uh, for Kivi to use it. And Kivi comes with, um, comes with the tools to allow you to do that. Uh, but for this application, I, I didn't do it. 
Um, this is me hiding my face on the side. It's, this is the first application that I uh, actually wrote wholly within Kivi. Uh, and uh, the application is, the purpose of the application is to take a photo and grid it so that you can freehand draw the photo. Um, and the things, the reason this is relevant is because you can't, I had hoped that I might have a, a camera to show you how it worked. But the thing, the thing about this application is that um, you get pinch zoom and scale and translate and rotate all for free by using a, a widget called the scatter widget. So these, all the, everything you can see on there is, is floating on top of this thing called a scatter widget, which means I can just pinch it, zoom it, uh, move it around however I like, uh, and for, for basically no coding. Um, uh, I also wanted to say, later on I'll talk about um, this thing called the templating langu language for Kivi. I hope you can see them, but there's these little crosshairs with a, lot, with a number label beside them. And each of those things is a widget which I have, well, it's a custom widget, I guess, which I've subclassed from um, the Kivi widget um, class. Uh, and um, every time you instantiate one of these things, Kivi just does it all for you. It puts together uh, where, the, where the label has to be and puts the, the crosshairs where you want it and, and so forth. And the buttons are a bit boring down the side. But you can load up images to those buttons if, if um, well, you're probably obviously going to do that. So more about Kivi. Well, working in Kivi is pretty easy because it's pretty much pure Python all of the way. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it supports multi-touch, so you can get uh, multiple events on your screen. So if someone's touching, you're going to get a, events for all of those fingers that are coming down. Um, you've got this pinch, pinch, zoom, and rotate, which you see on all of those mobile apps, and you get it pretty much for free. Um, it implements uh, an observer pattern, so uh, you don't have to worry about maintaining where your dirty rectangles are. You just move the widget from one point to another, and Takinta, Takinta does it for you, updates the position on the screen. And so in this previous one, the idea is that you can press on one of these um, crosshairs and just dr drag it across the screen. Uh, and Kivi will update it for you if all you do is just say, look, put it in this position, put it in this position. Just, you just give it new pauses all the time and it, it'll move it for you. Kivi also supports um, Android idi idioms. Um, life cycle intents and intense fil fil intent filters. Uh, and intents are how Android does interprocess uh, communications. Uh, uh, and the thing to note here is that if you want to do work on Android and you want to have some interaction with the Android environment on your device, uh, you're going to have to learn about Android. So you can't just do it entirely within um, a Python uh, view of the world. Well, how does Kivi get you there? Well, it um, basically takes the whole of Python and drops it into an APK, uh, and it runs the Python interpreter for your um, for your co over your code. Uh, Kivi also comes with this thing called I don't know how to pronounce it Py Pygenius Pygenius. Um, and the purpose of that is to allow you to access any of the Java libraries through Python. Uh, and so it's through this Pigeonius library that you can uh, access the Andro Android APIs. Um, but it's a bit difficult. I haven't, uh, other than, I mean, I've done a little bit, but not, not greatly. If you're going to do it, you need to understand how Java's working on the API in order to give it what, it, what it's looking for. In order to get Kivi producing an APK for you, you need to install a heap of dependencies. So um, developing using, using Kivi is really just like writing a Python program on your PC. And once you've, you, can, you can create on the PC and test it on the PC. And once you've finished, you can use this, this tool called Buildozer, which will basically automatically produce your APK for you. Uh, once you've got that APK, you can either sideload it onto your device, which is basically what I've done. But you can also uh, align it and sign it 
if you have a developer account and then you can upload it to Google Play and then anybody can get it. Um, in order to develop with Kivi, because you're using the widgets, you sort of have to write or rewrite your UI using the Kiwi widgets, which is what I did in that first um, example I showed you. But otherwise, you're pretty much free to use any Python li library you like, um, including, I think, the networking libraries. So um, you can, you're very free to use, uh, to use Python behind the, the view. Kiwi also comes with this thing called, um, uh, well, they're called Kiwi files, but it's a templating language. So you can, for each of your interesting widgets, you don't have to program programmatically create them. You can just say, well, look, you know, located at this point, reference to some variable in the, the object. Uh, you can, and it just puts it all together for you. The Kivi language is a bit difficult in so far as it makes some assumption. It's got some implicit, it's got some implicitness to it, to it, and it's not ob always obvious how to get what you want from the Kivi language based on um, get from your code to the to the finished product via the the, the Kivi language. The process of um, developing with Kivi is pretty simple. You, although you have to have a thing called the main.py um, script. You have to um, find the kiwi.application class and subclass that for your application. Um, you need to have a build method in the application and that application has to return a widget, kiwi widget of some sort. And that kiwi widget becomes your application's root widget. So build does something and at the end of it, it returns a widget and that widget is where um, control is handed over to, over to. And this creates a separation between your application and your widget and I find um, I have a tendency to just put all of the code into the widget and that means, you know, I've got this problem of, uh, I've got this problem of um, separating the view from what you know, the, the, the controller and what's going on. Uh, and I, my experience, it's a similar experience that I have when I'm using um, Tikinta, I guess. So once you've got your Python program working and you can test it on your PC or your Mac, you don't need to deploy it to a device in order to test it, uh, except to the extent it makes use of Android-specific stuff. Um, once you're happy with it, you can use uh, a tool which comes with um, with Kiwi called Buildozer, and Buildozer just basically does it for you. There's a whole lots of little bits and pieces that it does, but it it um, I think it compiles it compiles the Python interpreter for you. It compiles your stuff into um, um, into PYO files. Uh, it puts together a specifications file, it puts together some XML that, that Java needs when it gets onto the, when, that Android needs um, to know what to do with your file. Um, and it, it, it just produces the APK. The first time you run it, it's a bit slow because it's doing all this work. Um, but every time you do a change, it only, it only works on the changes that you do. So the second and third builds are much faster than the first. Uh, Buildozer is, tries to be really helpful it can be a little bit overly helpful sometimes because it's downloading stuff that you might not want and it's downloading it to a place where I found that I didn't want it to be downloading to. But by and large, it's, uh, it's a simple and painless operation to get Buildozer producing an APK for you. Um, if you are wanting to um, interact with the broader Android environment, um, uh, you can. And so it's got, uh, Kivi <coughs> does support this inter-process communication that Android has called intents. You can, um, you can register what's called an intent filter. And in a, an intent filter might be something that you would use, for example, where you have a, a file manager and you press, you click on a .doc file and it'll open up an application with that .doc, .doc file open for you. Um, uh, you can do that uh, using Kivi. And so I've... For that um, gridder application, 
I've got my own, uh, my own file extension. If I click on one of those files in the file manager, it'll, it'll open PV for me automatically. It'll do the file association um, for me. It, in order to do that, in order to do work with that broader Android environment though, you have to understand this thing called the Android lifecycle uh, and that requires a little bit of um, research because it's not entirely, it's not intuitively obvious why Android does the thing it, things it does. But basically the, the, the thing about Android is that originally it was designed so that the operating system could kill any application at any time without notice or, or with very little warning. And so what it has is these requirements or it has these options for you called, um, you can write methods called on pause and on resume and on stop and on start and Android will call these methods for you um, at the appropriate times. So if someone takes a phone, the idea was if someone takes a phone call it wants to kill the app, the app that you're looking at and, and pass control over to the, to the call. And so if you haven't written your Python code to anticipate the fact that the operating system might just be killing your app for no good reason, uh, it's not going to work properly on, on Android. Um, you can, um, but the long and the short of it is that you can um, you can implement all of these things. Have I? Yeah. So you can you can implement on pause and on resume and on start and on stop. You can you can implement um, interprocess communication, which is the well. You can intent you can you can do intent filters, which is if I click on a click on a file, it'll open the, the application for you. In theory, you can do interprocess communication, which is creating an intent and shooting it off to, um, to some other application. And equally, if, you're, if your application is running, you can, you can receive an intent that comes from um, some other application. At the moment, uh, it's got a few wrinkles in the way that it's implemented and um, Kivi actually can't properly receive an intent from, from another application. The applica if your application is running, it has trouble receiving new intents because it assumes that your application is a service and not actually an application. And the way they've implemented on pause and on resume doesn't work quite right. It's fine for when you first start the application, but not if it's already running. So the documentation for Kivi is reasonably complete. I've had a lot of frustrating experiences finding things in the docs, but my, my, you know, my experience is that they tend to be there, it's just they might not be where I expect them to be. Um, the, the docs for the Pigeonius um, library are not that great, uh, and in fact I've you know, stuck to following what other people have done in their tutorials rather than trying to decode uh, the, the documentation. So what are some of the issues with Kivi? Um, well, the docs that I just mentioned, um, using Android and Java requires you to understand some, some part of Android and Java. Um, using Android, um, if you just want to do an application, perhaps like a game, which doesn't care about what the rest of the, the device is doing, then you don't actually have to worry about Android and Java. But once you get into doing, trying to uh, work in the Android environment, then you do. Um, the compile cycle, well, <laughs> I don't want to work in Python, so I don't want to go through a compile cycle. But if you've got any Android specific stuff, you actually do need to compile it. So if you want to test on how on pause is working, then you have to get it to either a virtual device or to a, um, a physical device. Uh, and that's just, you know, 60 second compile for me every time uh, and then it runs. It's not, it's not a big deal but it is a small deal. Uh, I found introspection really difficult uh, and especially when you have to work through a, an Android virtual device because you're effectively looking through the log files and trying to anticipate what you're looking for and sometimes you're trying to dump all of the objects and it doesn't always want to do that for you. Um, so. Um, my introspection, you're not going to get as much as you expect to get or as you'd like to get. Kivi has some implicit context rules, uh, more with the Kivi language, with the templating language that I was talking about. Um, and sometimes that means it's difficult for me to sync the 
if I want to pro programmatically create a widget, it's difficult for me to sync that with what I'm with the templating with what the templating language is trying to do in the widget creation. Uh, and I had a bit of trouble with some of the bubbling when I clicked on a, a widget which was above another widget. I had trouble working it out. It wasn't coming from where I was. The, the events were not coming from where I was thinking they were coming from. Pygame subset for Android. So <laughs> that's, that's Kivi for you. I hope it wasn't too fast. But uh, that's an overview of what Kivi was. And, and I guess I, I would, before I stop talking about Kivi, I just think Kivi's great because it solves this problem of getting stuff to Android. And I've got these Android devices. And it's really easy for me to get um, a functional Python program working on them. Pygame subset for Android, as it says, is a port of Pygame. So if you have an application that is written in Pygame or you want to write an application which is in Pygame, uh, this is where you go to. Uh, it'll allow you to do it. The only problem is it's Python 2.7 only. It's not for Python 3 at the moment. Space Phyto, I'm not sure. Yeah, you can see the little ships. So this is my Pygame application that I wrote uh, probably about four or five years ago as something to do. It's a vector graphics space fighting game. Uh, and this was my candidate for porting to Android for using Pygame subset for Android. How do I do it? Well, it's pretty simple, really. Um, you put your code again in a main.py function. Sorry, you, have, you put it in a main.py file. You have a main function in main.py, and you pass control uh, to, main, to the main function. So my space photo game took about um, maybe an hour to port uh, 1,200 lines of code. From, from pure Pygame to um, Space Fido, Pygame for subset for Android. Uh, it really was super, super, super simple. Um, you know, I, I probably changed 10 lines of code. I moved stuff around, but if you exclude the movements, I didn't really actually do much uh, addition. But I found that once I got it running on my Android device, I didn't have a keyboard. And so the assumptions that I'd made when I developed it initially uh, were no longer valid. So it was there, but I couldn't actually control the spaceships. Um, and uh, there are also regular pauses in the game, which um, I haven't debugged yet. So in summary, um, Kivi solves an important problem, which is distribution. And it solves that problem by leveraging, by, by giving you a method of leveraging these third-party app stores. My experience of Pygame subset for Android is that it's very easy to port an existing um, application. But the problem is you can't rely on the existence of a keyboard. Uh, and you probably didn't realize that when you were first doing your game. And so um, in practice, you're always going to need to have an, a, a user interface rewrite because the interface is, is different in both of them. There's some references if you're interested. Does, does anybody have any questions? Was that sort of a whirlwind tour or what? Um, you have, uh, Kivi can generate for Android and iOS. Yes. Can it also generate for Windows and like Mac desktop? So it, I don't think it creates an exe file if that's what you're talking about. No, I think you have to use one of those other packaging um, solutions. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, if you don't want to package it, I mean, you just. Sorry, it will run on Windows. If you just, if you can just go Python name of name of application, it'll still run. And you need all of the development environment. No. No, well, you need the Kivi library. So the Kivi library needs to be installed. But apart from that, that that's all. But you won't, but, and your code will have to anticipate that it's not an Android or it's not iOS and do things appropriately. But in principle, yes. There's Py2exe. Um, any major Android version or device restrictions? Ah, no. No, not that I've, I mean, I haven't done a lot of, looking into it, but I think that it's, I can't remember the version of Android which it's 
wanting to get, but I think it's quite an old version. It's like 2.2 or something. And you can specify what version you want. So build the Buildozer the Buildozer application or tool uh, allows you to f specify any of the um, metadata requirements that you could for a Java. So you can you can specify that it needs a certain version of Android or a certain version of whatever. The only thing is, um, like I said, yeah. yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And so that's where the intent filter rules go in. It, you, can, you can actually do your own manifest XML and ask it to, to pull it in as well. So it, it, yes, no problem. Uh, the template files, the, the template files, uh, are they only at compile time or can you render them at runtime? Like can you load a template? to be rendered, if That's you like. a good question. I think you can probably, I have not tried. I think you can load it at runtime if you want to, um, because there's a, f there's a method that allows you to just give it a string and ask, and ask it to create a widget based on the string, assuming the string is a, a, you know, a template file. So I would guess yes. Uh, over here. Um, on one of your slides, you said something about you need to become familiar with some aspects of the Android environment, and I was just curious to know how you'd found that process. Of, you know, what is the quality of the documentation, or yeah? Oh, not that great. <laughs> so I, I remember looking at it myself a little while ago and finding it pretty perplexing. Yeah. So, so um, I've dabbled in writing Java programs for uh, Android prior to trying to work with Kivi. So in a sense, I, I, I'd done my bashing my head against the wall on that beforehand. Uh, it's much, much easier writing this stuff in Kivi and deploying it to Android than trying to do the same thing in Java. It's, it's just like a world of difference. It's so much, so much easier. Um, and, and, and if you want to have an application which is self-contained, you can sort of ignore the rest of Android really. It's only if you want to deal with the rest of the world. So for example, I mean some things with Android, if you turn, if you turn a screen around, you, you've got an orientation change and that can kill the program. Like the Android expects you to kill the program and then start it again. Um, and those sorts of things are what you can do with, um, with knowledge of the Android operating system. All right, so um, one last question from me and then we can then. Uh, we, uh, you mentioned uh, manifest.xml earlier, so do you have to like um, put your permissions in there as well? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, cool. So file writing and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so everyone please give a big hand to Brendan. <laughs>